Welcome to my channel, The Binge Eating Therapist. I'm Sarah, former binge eater turned psychotherapist, and my mission is to use this space to bring content to you to help you understand your struggle with food and break free from binge eating. I receive a number of requests to talk about binge eating and trauma, and I've kind of shied away from this subject on the channel because it's a complex subject, because everybody's experience is so unique, but it does feel like an important subject to talk about because the research shows quite a strong link between trauma and binge eating disorder. It's not gonna be the case for everyone, but with binge eating, there is a higher instance of trauma than in the other eating disorders. So there's something going on here. And I wanted to begin this video by sharing a personal story of mine. So before I was a therapist, I was a police officer in London. And one day I'm out with a colleague and we went to arrest somebody who was wanted at their home. Well, this person didn't want to be arrested. So we ended up getting in a bit of a fight trying to restrain this guy. And during the fight, my colleague was knocked unconscious managed to get the guy into handcuffs and the minute he was handcuffed he stopped struggling and he just went calm and he was just standing there so I'm stood in front of this guy and I'm looking around for my colleague and then I see a flash of light and I get like a, a bolt of pain and it, it took me a second to realize what had happened but while I was stood there this guy just leant forward and head butted me and, and broke my nose I actually ended up having to go and get it fixed so my nose is still not straight even to this day because of this instance. We'd already called for backup, so other colleagues arrived within seconds of this happening and this guy was taken away. And my colleague who was knocked out, fortunately, was, was okay in the end. What happened for the next two hours was, even though I felt pretty calm, I didn't feel particularly distressed by what happened, I wasn't in a lot of pain, and at this point I didn't even know my nose was broken, but for the next couple of hours, I couldn't stop shaking. Like my body was just shaking. And I remember feeling quite embarrassed about it. It was an hour later and I was still had those like adrenaline shakes and I couldn't write my notes up. So I had to dictate my notes to one of my colleagues who did the writing for me because I couldn't even hold a pen. What I know now that I didn't know back then was that this was my body having a trauma response. And we see this in the animal kingdom as well. If an animal gets attacked and then gets away, that animal will shake. And it's a way of processing that energy that floods the body during uh, an event like this. What I didn't know at the time, but realized later, was because I shook after this happened, I wasn't left with any negative charge in my body from the event. So I could talk about it easily without feeling upset. I didn't really think about it. I didn't have any flashbacks or intrusive thoughts about what happened. I mean, it wasn't ideal, but it was one of those things. It happened. There was one incident, maybe about six months later, when I was in a similar situation and I had a flash of something go through my mind because it reminded me of the occasion when I was headbutted. So it wasn't like I forgot what happened, but it wasn't overwhelming and I realized what it was. I was like, oh gosh, I'm feeling a bit uneasy. That's probably because this situation is a bit similar to the last situation when I was injured. Compare this to, so this was I think around 2009, uh, about a year later I had to have a lumbar puncture which is where they stick a needle in your spine to get some spinal fluid out. And I'd gone to the hospital about midday to have this done. And I had to wait around for over four hours because they wanted a trainee to come and do the lumbar puncture because they needed to tick it off their task book or something like that. So this lady comes along and she's being supervised by a doctor and she's trying to do the lumbar puncture and she's sticking this needle in my spine and she can't get the right place. And the needle's going in and then out and then in and then they put some more local in and I was in so much pain. Um, I was crying, my mother was there, she was crying. <laughs> the, the doctors were getting really flustered and in, for me, this felt like it went on forever. Eventually they tell me, we've managed to do it. What I found out, which I couldn't see at the time, was the doctor in the end had taken it off the trainee and done it immediately in one go. What I also realized afterwards was when I looked at the clock, this had been going on for nearly 35 minutes. So I'd been lying there for half an hour with a needle going in and out of my spine, 
No one's stopping it when this is a, a procedure that could have been done in a matter of seconds by someone who knew what they were doing. Because I had waited so long as well, what you're supposed to do after a lumbar puncture is lie down for a couple of hours, but they wanted me out, so I got kicked out, couldn't lie down, so I also had a banging headache for two days. The whole experience was really distressing. And I found that every time I even spoke about this experience, for the next couple of years, I was flooded with those feelings again. I felt like crying. I felt, because in that moment, I just felt really unprotected. I was in a lot of pain. I was frightened. It felt like an eternity. And that feeling, those feelings were still in my body. They hadn't gone anywhere. They hadn't had an outlet and they hadn't been processed. So you could think of that as a, a trapped trauma. It's something trapped in my body that gets activated when I thought about it and when I spoke about it to anyone else. If you were to ask a dozen therapists to give you a definition of trauma, they're probably all going to vary a bit, but there will be some overlap as well. Quite often people think about trauma, they're thinking about abuse, they're thinking about sexual assault, they're thinking about um, violence. Um, but actually trauma can also include things like emotional neglect. Um, I've heard people argue the case for, and I'm inclined to agree, dieting, restriction, being a type of trauma, you're withholding something that your body needs for survival, so therefore you're gonna have a strong response. So I would describe trauma as any type of distressing experience or event that overwhelms your ability to cope or function. It tends to overwhelm you mentally, emotionally, and at the nervous system level. When we're talking about trauma, we're really talking about the body. There's a very popular book about trauma called The Body Keeps the Score, and in it, Bessel van der Kolk, I think his name is, you know, he talks about your body basically being like a scorecard and keeping a tally of these events and these things that happen to you. And anything that doesn't get processed at the time kind of gets stuck and can be reactivated. Many people will think of trauma, they'll think of things like abuse and violence and sexual assault, all these kind of big events. Trauma can be an accumulation of lots of smaller events. Emotional neglect and your growing up is leaves its mark on you. It's not safe to express how you feel and you don't understand your feelings, so therefore they get trapped. Even witnessing like aggression and certain events can create trauma as well. I don't know about you, but I can remember as a kid, my parents were like yelling at each other. I can remember like that feeling of fear and unsafety in my body of what's going on between these two important figures in my life. Like it felt pretty frightening to a kid. So when we're trying to understand how we might think about trauma when it comes to how we're eating, I think what we're talking about here is inner safety. We have two worlds. We have the outer world, we have our inner world, and those two worlds interact. But if we have really good inner safety and we generally feel pretty safe in our bodies, we can cope when life is overwhelming, when stressful things happen, because inside we've got an innate sense of groundedness and feeling okay. If you find yourself frequently feeling not safe, like maybe your own emotions don't feel safe, or certain situations don't feel safe, even though your rational mind tells you that actually they are okay, chances are that this is similar to what we might think of as a trauma response. Whether you use the word trauma or not, it kind of, it's not really important. I'm thinking here of like energy that's trapped in the body. And of course, people who struggle with binge eating, <laughs> one thing that we're very good at if we're binging is we're able to cut off from what's going on in the body, at least for a while. Quite often it tries to grab our attention. Some people I've worked with feel numb most of the time. Although I'd say the majority of people like kind of go in and out, they'll use food to try and numb something that just, they don't know what to do with. It feels overwhelming. So when I was thinking about this video and what can I actually provide a value to somebody watching this video, I thought I would share with you a few tips of processing and working through trapped emotion and energy in the body. Now, not all of these are gonna be suitable for everyone. You know, it's that 
maybe you want to experiment and just check in with how you're feeling and which ones you might be more drawn to than others because some of these techniques are great for one person and another person they just find them even more activating so i came up with seven quick tips things that you can look up and try uh, and see how you get on so the first one is the breath breath work now for some people focusing on their breath has a real calming effect when they control their breath when they slow it down other people the minute you focus on your breath you might feel panic you might not feel safe so this might not be one for you if that's where you're at the one that i personally like that i get a lot of benefit from is the Wim Hof breathing technique. I'll put a link for it below. You can watch it for free on YouTube and they've got like breathe along videos, is that what you call them? Where you can just play them and do the breathing technique with somebody guiding you at the same time. I have found that when I do this particular one, I just feel reset. I feel so calm, I feel so clear and everything feels okay. I know that sounds like a pretty big claim, but like I genuinely feel great. And it's one of those things that I often think I could probably do with doing more often, but it's quite hard work because you, there's a lot of intense breathing, but it's one you might like. If you prefer something that slows you down, look up some yoga nidra on YouTube and just do like a body scan and the breath work with that and just slow down in that way and just see how you get on with these. These are ones that are quite hard. I would say breath work can be quite challenging to reach for in the moment when you're activated. But if it's something you incorporate regularly and you gain benefit from it, it can help kind of keep you from being as activated as quickly. The idea as well behind breath work is that our breath exists in the moment. And if we're focusing on our breath, we are focusing on the moment. And trauma can often pull us into the past or try and predict the future. And that's often where we're feeling unsafe more so than the actual moment and the second one is movement and you might find that the kind of movement that slows you down like a yoga or a tai chi makes you feel calmer and better or you might prefer the kind of movement where your heart rate is elevated because that can burn through some cortisol and it just changes your uh, biochemistry as well but in a different way so it's noticing like with movement, which one feels better for you? Walking is a brilliant one. Walking is like, it's quite close to, you have EMDR, which is another trauma therapy. EMDR focuses on bilateral movements and walking is what they call a bilateral movement. You're using both sides of your body in a rhythmic way, which activates both sides, both hemispheres in the brain. And they talk about going for a walk clears your head because it really does, it's a pretty good reset and getting outside as well is very helpful too. Just any kind of movement that's going to move energy and shift what's going on in the body. But again, this is one to test out for yourself what kind of movement feels the best for you. And movement is a great add-on, probably not one that you want to rely on solely, particularly if you struggled with eating disorders, because that can be like another uh, slippery slope that might become a coping mechanism that isn't healthy for you in the long run but it can be a really good add-on to some of these other things as well the third one is around thought work so i'm not saying that you can just rationalize how you're feeling away i don't think it works like that but what is going on in our mind and how we're thinking and speaking to ourselves does impact our bodily responses so ideally we want to be developing a voice in our mind that is nurturing supportive wise it doesn't mean we're going to completely get rid of the critic. We can't chop out parts of our thoughts, but we can create and practice new ways of looking at things, new ways of speaking to ourselves. We can challenge some beliefs, some of even the really long held beliefs that perhaps are no longer serving us by questioning. And uh, you can look up Byron Katie, the work, she does some great worksheets on how to question some of your beliefs. And shifting your beliefs can be enormously helpful when it comes to trying to change your experience. Because if we're having the same thoughts and beliefs over and over again, chances are we're gonna keep going around the same cycles. So looking at how you're talking to yourself really and what it is you are believing in the moment. What's the story? We're always telling ourselves a story 
when you are feeling triggered or activated, what are the stories that are being activated? And can you shine a light on those and do a bit of work around questioning the validity and how true those stories have to be today? They were probably true once. Doesn't mean they always have to be true. The next one is around co-regulation. So we impact each other, who you spend time with, um, who you confide in, who you turn to for support, who you have around you. All of these things can either support you or get in the way when you're trying to do trauma work or heal some unprocessed experiences that are still in your body. This is about safe connections. It's about having people around you who are supportive. Now, relationships can be challenging too, and people can be triggering and not necessarily be toxic people. So in relationships, there's also, I think, an important piece here around taking responsibility for asking for what you need from other people, not assuming they're gonna know what to say or know what to do that's gonna be reassuring. Some of you who are more touch oriented, sometimes what you just want is a hug and not advice. Some of you who are more cerebral, you might wanna be able to thrash something out with somebody you trust. So this comes from a place of self-awareness and identifying how you can use the connections you have in your life to help regulate your emotional state. Some people find that visualization techniques are really helpful with this work. There's one that might be worth looking up called the rewind technique. And they use things like, you imagine, it's, it's normally better if your trauma or your experience kind of comes from a one-off experience as opposed to lots and lots of different experiences. And you imagine the scene playing out on like a movie screen and you're watching it and you make it black and white and you speed it up, you slow it down, you, um, you rewind it, <laughs> go backwards, all these things. And what it does is it enables you to separate yourself from what happened, to become an observer, create that bit of distance, and to take some control over the situation as well, which is what you're doing when you're doing some of these visualization techniques. Some people love them. I don't find them particularly great because I'm just not a very visual person, but for some people they can work like magic. And another one that's become very popular in recent years is uh, vagus theory or vagus nerve theory. And the idea is we have the vagus nerve, which is part of our nervous system, and it's a big nerve that, that winds its way through the body. And when this nerve is massaged or stimulated, it has a calming impact on the nervous system. Eating stimulates the vagus nerve. Deep breathing stimulates the vagus nerve. There's all these other techniques that are coming out that are supposed to stimulate the vagus nerve as well. Um, you can just look them up on YouTube and try some of them out. A simple one I saw the other day was where you, you sit down, your feet on the floor, you take a couple of breaths, and then you look to the right, and you just find a focus point, and you keep your eyes very still for about 30 seconds, and you just look and hold it. And then when you've done 30 seconds on one side, you do the same on the other side, you look to your left and you hold it for 30 seconds. And you just notice your breath and what you tend to find is that your breathing changes a bit. It worked quite well for me actually, I found myself sighing a lot, which apparently is a, is a good sign that you are releasing. And sighing is great by the way, sighing really does release tension, that's why we do it. Um, so have a couple of sighs as well if you need to. And the last one that I just wanna share with you is that Sometimes, maybe slightly counterintuitively, in order to create a bit more safety inside, we need to be less hyper-focused on the inside. So it's about looking outwards and finding something purposeful outside of yourself. Now that could be anything from making a quilt to doing something for someone else to some bigger project but something that feels meaningful to you. So you get to have a sense of satisfaction, to feel like you have an impact in the world, to feel like you matter. And this can be done on just micro scales as well. It doesn't mean you have to have some grand life purpose, but it's just this idea of doing something that impacts someone or something outside of you. So these were just a few things I wanted to share with you today. As I mentioned, it's a big subject and I didn't have time to get into 
disconnecting and disassociation, perhaps that could be another video. This is more about moving and shifting energy that gets stuck in your body, which is part of the trauma response. Even if you don't believe the thing that caused it warrants such a big response. We don't need to judge it. We just want to try and make sense of it and find a way to release it, calm our bodies down so that food doesn't become the only option to go to. But I do have a podcast episode coming out about disconnecting from yourself. That will be out in a couple of weeks. It's the Life After Diets podcast. You might want to check that out as well because it will nicely follow on from what I've been talking about here today. So I hope this was useful. If you have some more specific questions and areas that you would like me to dive into around this subject, then please pop them in the chat below and I will consider doing a video on them if I can. Thank you for watching, go well, and I will see you on the next video.